to, I just sent you an email about this. If you go to this URL, uh, you'll find something that says student post-test. Don't try to take the pre-test, it's all shut off. All right, so you only get the post-test. And the student materials evaluation. If you do uh, either of those, you will get 1.4 each. All right, I'd actually prefer if you do both. It's completely voluntary, you don't have to do it. This, I am doing some research on this. We're trying to get this module buffed up and improved. And hopefully we're going to publish it because you might have realized everything we used is accessible to everybody in the world. So I'm trying to show instructors elsewhere how they can do this great module, even if they don't lucky enough to have labs and equipment and mice and all that other good stuff that we tend to have at UCLA. So I'm trying to get it in some kind of shape to send it out to the world and show that it indeed is an effective teaching tool. So if you do that, I'd appreciate it. If you still want, I still have to make this disclaimer, if you still want the extra credit and you don't want to participate, come and talk to me about doing an alternate assignment, which will probably be a one-page paper for each point of extra credit. I have to do this. It's part of the rules. Okay, uh, so that's my pre-lecture, and so let's get on with the real lecture. What I'm going to do in this lecture is uh, I am going to go over what I wanted you to get out of this unit, and hopefully that you did get out of this unit or will be getting shortly out of this unit. So my pedagogical objectives, my teaching objectives, first of all, was to give you a short review of genetics, which should indeed have been a review for all of you. We talked a little bit about uh, genes being linked and linkage, and if genes were linked on the same chromosome, we talked about the fact that uh, we would then predict that we would get a 50-50 inheritance pattern if they were indeed linked, and then we also talked about the fact that that 50-50 prediction doesn't hold up, that it's not quite 50-50, and that's how people discovered recombination, okay? And we also talked about how our recombinant inbred strains came to be. And uh, since I got some questions in lab, I'm going to go over this slide in some detail. So our recombinant inbred strains started out with two strains uh, that were fully inbred. These are the F0. So we either had the C57 BL slash 6Js, which we, from that point forward, started calling the B mouse, and, or we had the DBA slash 2Js, which we there called the D mouse. So these are our F0s, and they had to be highly discrepant on our phenotype of interest. And I checked it out, and indeed, these two st strains were really discrepant on the size of their olfactory bulbs. All right, so that makes them good candidates for this kind of analysis. So what we did is we crossed these two F0 strains, and what we're representing here is with these blue or red bars is a single chromosome pair, but this would be what you're going to see in this slide would be true for all the chromosome pairs. So, uh, of course, in the F1 generation, uh, these particular mice, these mice are isogenic, they all have the same genes, uh, but with regard to where their uh, genes came from, they're completely heterozygous, right? So they have uh, one chromosome from their mom and one chromosome from their dad. Each one of them has this kind of pattern of chromosomes, one from the mom strain, the B strain, one from the dad strain, the D strain. What we then did was we crossed these F1s, and when we cross these F1 strains, uh, what happens is uh, we get recombination. Of course, you always get recombination, but in this case, it's going to really matter. So when these F1s go to make their gametes, uh, these chromosomes from the mom and the dad are going to get back together, there's going to be some crossing over and some recombination. So in that fashion, we are going to then be mixing up the DNA from the uh, mom strain and the dad's F0 strain. So it's going to be mixed up. As you can see, these chromosomes now carry uh, kind of a collage or of these, uh, the DNA from the F0 strains. 
And as you can also see in this diagram, uh, these particular, again, at this point, a particular strain could be uh, heterozygous for a given gene. So let's just take this first character right here, and we see that this individual, let's say that I'm putting my light on a region that would have a gene, uh, would that gene be heterozygous or homozygous? Hetero, okay. So we don't want that. We want to mix up the F0 DNA in some fashion, but we want everyone to be fairly uniform. All right, and, and so the goal to get them, how are we going to get all these uh, F2s to be uniform? It's not a rhetorical question. And breed them. We're going to inbreed the heck out of them for 20 generations, brother, sister, pairs for 20 generations. And what that will do is they, a given gene a ge will lock into being homozygous. So a given gene will have the same allele. We will still, at the end of 20 generations, have some kind of combination of the F0 DNA. Okay? But, and I, let me go on to say, every individual within that recombinant inbred strain will have essentially the same DNA. Of course, with some asides, like male and female, obviously they can't have perfectly the same. Uh, they'd have X's and Y's, uh, would be different. But all the other chromosomes should be pretty much the same. Okay? So within a recombinant inbred strain, those chromosomes are the same. But across these recombinant inbred strains, they're going to represent different combinations of that F0 DNA. What we're then going to do is say, okay, so now we're going to see how these different combinations of the F0 com DNA are going to have, will they have differential phenotypes back to our olfactory bulbs? Will their olfactory bulbs look different across these different recombinant inbred strains? And if they do, we might be able to nail, in fact we were, able to probably nail the pieces of chromosome that made a 